Satan will use all your emotions so he can be victorious. His name is the deceiver. The pastors don't think these things are going out of their interrogation. I believe that the devil does exist. Be a disciple and make a disciple. If you don't do that by being a pastor, spectator. Confronting the Devil with the Overwhelming, Almighty, Omnipotent Power of the Lord Jesus Christ. His power is absolute. He cannot be stopped. Welcome to Confronting the Devil, Fearless Dialogue. Here's your host, Kevin Collier. Thank you, Steve, and welcome to the program. On today's show, our guests include the Reverend Dr. Robert Bennett, Christian warrior Jeff Cook, and Archbishop Ron File. And sitting beside me here, I'd like to introduce my wife, Kristen Collier. She will be providing prayer and scripture at the top of every program. Thanks, Kristen. This is from Treasury of Daily Prayer from Concordia Publishing House. Lord Jesus, you are the stronger man who plundered Satan's house by casting out demons with your finger and finishing him off by your death on the cross. Blessed are those who hear your word and keep it by the works of mercy and charity, as Satan falls like lightning from heaven when he sees you and us. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Martin Luther said that focusing on Jesus prevents heresies. This is from What Luther Says in Anthology, Volume 1. I have found and noted in all histories of the whole Christian Church that all those who have had and have maintained the central article of Jesus Christ in its integrity have remained safe and sound in the true Christian faith. Although they erred and sinned in other respects, yet they were finally saved. How did Luther say that God uses us, weak human beings, to mock the devil? This is actually kind of funny. God places a poor vessel into the midst of enemies. If I were a strong man, I too would be angry if someone wanted to make a fool of me with a wisp of straw. I suppose I would tear the wisp of straw to pieces in anger and would rather have him confront me with a spear, sword, and complete armor, even as mighty Goliath was angry when David dared to step up against him with a staff without armor. 1 Samuel 17:43. So the devil is angry because God intends to tread him underfoot through flesh and blood. If a great spirit were his opponent, he would not be so angry, but it irritates him greatly that a poor carcass, a paltry vessel, should sit there and bid him defiance, a weak vessel pitted against so powerful a prince. Now all this happens, says Paul, that we may know that matters do not depend upon our might, but upon the might of God. So God bids the devil defiance and says to him, You mighty spirit, I shall place a poor weak vessel before you, I challenge you to attack him. This annoys the devil immeasurably, hence he goes about as a roaring lion and would love to break and shatter the weak pots and vessels. How did Luther say that we should treat the devil, with respect or contempt? Satan may be overcome by contempt, but in faith, not in presumption. However, he is certainly not to be invited, for he is a powerful enemy, seeing and hearing everything that lies about us and that we are now talking about. How did Luther say that we should get rid of the devil? Confessing Christ often chases the devil away. I have read that a man who could have no peace because of the devil made the sign of the cross on his chest and said, The word was made flesh, or, what amounts to the same thing, I am a Christian. Then the devil was defeated and chased away, and the man had peace. And I believe that this is true if the man spoke these words from a believing heart. One does not gain much ground against the devil with a lengthy disputation, but with brief words and replies, such as, I am a Christian of the same flesh and blood as is my Lord Christ, the Son of God. Settle your account with him, then the devil does not stay long. How did the Master himself, Jesus, confront the devil? Mark 1, 23-28 Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone! What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet, and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Then they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. Thank you, Kristen. My first guest, Rev. Dr. Robert Bennett, is the Executive Director of the Luther Academy and author of the books Afraid and I Am Not Afraid, about demonic possession and spiritual warfare. Dr. Bennett, thank you for joining me. 
Oh, I thank you for taking the time to have me on today. Dr. Bennett, how would you address the notion that the devil and the demonic are a thing of legend, fantasy, and fiction? Well, I know a lot of people in the modern world would like to say that. However, uh, such a uh, position would put you in complete opposition to Holy Scripture, uh, Old Testament and New Testament, as well as opposition to the history of, of the Church, and most specifically um, to Jesus in First John, uh, and we're even told that the reason the Son of Man came was to defeat the works of the devil. So, so First John actually sums it up into the point that that is that is the, one of the major or the major reason uh, for Christ's coming. Now, of course, it's much more nuanced than that with our sin and the reason for His death on our behalf and His resurrection, but. Ultimately, death and, and everything that's uh, within our within our world, uh, sickness, poverty, all of that is related to the first sin where the devil was the one as the tempter where all of this began. Recently, as a guest on Skywatch TV, you said that reading certain scriptures out loud or particular prayers had an exercising effect. Can you explain that? Oh, sure. Um, one of the points of that, especially as it connected to um, to our Lutheran understanding, and some other Christian denominations may, may have this as well, but um, we understand where the Word of God is proclaimed, it's not only, it is all these things, but it's not only a historical word and an errant word and, and, and so on, uh, but it's also a word that promises Jesus' presence. And so connected to the Word of God in its proclamation is the promise that Jesus is there for us in um, in the midst of that uh, um, uh, that speaking? And so, when we talk about exorcism, we have to say, well, what is exorcism? Well, the word exorcism is simply the word "ekphalo" in Greek, and all it means is to to cast away, to push away, to remove something. That's that's the picture there. So it's not the kind of the glamorous scary, uh, intense picture that we see represented in our culture of how we view exorcism sometimes. And sometimes things get very out of hand, but for the most part, it's this idea of, uh, of removal. So if we connect the understanding of Jesus' presence in the, in the hymns that are based on the Word of God and the liturgy, which is, the liturgy is simply nothing other than the Word of God repeated back, um, and, and the promise of, of baptism, where Jesus promises that he's there in the midst of these things, uh, uh, creating new people uh, as they die to Jesus, they rise um, as well. So in, in this sense, we understand the presence of Jesus and the activity of all of these things are exorcistic in nature, because in, in their very nature, they are repelling, uh, pushing away uh, the devil, his demons, and so forth. Dr. Bennett, in your writing, metaphorically you state baptism is like the title of a car, that Jesus owns the car, that we as Christians are the car. The devil may steal it, but Jesus owns the title. I put that in for a very important reason. I'm getting ready to start on a third book right now, and the third book is going to be titled something to this effect. It always gets changed as it goes, but, but Fear and Lies, Unmasking the Devil is, is the intention. And I bring this up because of your question. The devil always seems to act um, with some type of continuum between fear and lies. See, after um, the crucifixion, he's really lost his power. He's, he's no longer that powerful being that we that we see in the, in the New Testament. Uh, John chapter 12 talks about it. That, you know, now is the time the prince of this world to be ekbalod, cast off his throne, speaking of the crucifixion. Um, so he really loses his power. So now how he operates is he works under this understanding of fear and lies. If I can make you afraid, I can control you. If I can lie to you, I can control you. An example you, you mentioned of that car, if somebody was to come and, 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 and look official, have paperwork that looks right, they could repossess that car, drive it away. It's all been a scam, actually even a crime. Mm -hmm. But the, the, it does not change the fact that they now have the car. And so Satan does that with people all the time. If he can convince them, um, either through fear or through a lie or some, some working amongst the two, uh, even though it's not true, he still has that power. 
I have a friend I interviewed for this program who was called to the home of a neighbor where an individual appeared to be suffering from a demonic possession. My friend prayed over this man with others in the room, and the demonic presence departed this fellow. This was essentially an exorcism. Can Christians, like my friend and I, help a brother to drive out a demon? Sure, and, and that's the other thing I think that you kind of showed in your words. Is it wasn't really a, an exorcism, but and, and so that's somewhat of a conditioning we've been kind of taught through Hollywood and listening to some of the Roman Catholic uh, uh, material that's out there. That, you know, what, is an, what is officially an exorcism? An exorcism is Jesus pushing away, casting away, removing uh, either Satan, the devil, um, the demons, or, or their activity from an individual or place. That's what an exorcism is. That's what we can talk in terms of baptism is an official exorcism. And, you know, so, so we have to kind of change how we think about these things. Now going back to the individual that you, that you mentioned, um, one thing I always make sure I always talk about whenever I'm uh, talking on the topic is First of things first, I am not an exorcist. And the reason I say that is none of us are exorcists. Jesus is the only exorcist. So it's always him. Right. So it's his power. So it's his word that removes that. And the person who, who's being used as, as the speaker of that power is simply that one who's being used, uh, who speaks those words. Now, uh, normally, uh, I mean, pastors are, are involved in these things because they're trained in them. Um, they're, 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 because they're trained, they should be better coped in how to respond to different issues as they come up. But um, in our own uh, hymnal, we, for instance, we have a uh, section for emergency baptism. Uh, I remember as a pastor that if, if I had a problem pregnancy and, and you know, I tell the, the, the uh, father, you know, contact me, I'll do a thing to get there at the, the birth, but it's not here. Right here is the, uh, is the baptism for this child, and it's just as uh, effective, effective as if I was to do so, because it's not about me, it's, it's the Word of God right. that's doing it. So in that sense, anyone with that Word of God can be called upon in that circumstance. The, the thing I would worry about, though, is these are things that I've, that I've learned from experience that you want to avoid doing as individuals. These are things that you want to do as, as a team with, with some other lay people and pastors, just so you're all there and, and with one another rather than kind of running off on your own and doing this kind of stuff. Sometimes we have to, that's just the way it goes. What can the average Christian do if they believe their home is under a demonic presence? Well, I think the first thing they should do is contact their pastor and, and make him respond. Um, because that too often what happens is the pastors don't think these things are going on in their congregations because the the people in the congregations aren't going to the pastor and and, and saying, hey, I, I need some help here. And that uh, well, second book that I wrote, Afraid, Demon Possession, uh, Spiritual Warfare in America, mm-hmm. there's a number of stories in that book of, of just that. These people are going through these things that either their pastor didn't know what to do and failed to help, or simply by contacting their pastor, they were able to alleviate uh, problems that they had for years. Um, just by talking to the pastor and having the pastor uh, work with them on, on some of the issues they had and going exercising the home, for instance. Uh, for Lutheran pastors, and I'm sure it would be for other denominations as well, we actually have we actually have exorcisms in our book, and we don't call them that. They're called the dedication of a dwelling or, mm-hmm. or a blessing of a home. But in essence, that's what they are, and the center part of that right is an exorcism of the home. That's what it is. And so pastor's been doing it forever. It's just, you know, we don't say, hey, we're going to do an exorcism of your home, because it kind of, you know, makes people a little bit uh, disturbed. Uh, but um, so if somebody came to me, I'd say, well, how about we go and do a, a blessing of your home? We'll, we'll do that. And, and so there's, there's ways to handle that. I appreciate your time, Dr. Bennett. Blessings to you and your upcoming book. Well, blessings to your, um, to your program there. Thanks again, Dr. Bennett. I recently spoke with Jeff Cook, a friend of 40 years, about a demonic experience he had a few decades ago. It had all the signs of being a demonic possession. I began my conversation with Jeff, asking him to recall how this experience unfolded. Well, I was uh, just sitting at home watching TV, and then all of a sudden the phone rings. My friend calls me and says uh, that he has a, a his sister and her baby daddy were from Chicago and they came to visit. The guy's name was Boule and he didn't speak any English. He just spoke uh, Spanish. 
But uh, one night, Bob called me. So there's something wrong with Bluey. I think he might be demon-possessed or something because he's acting really weird. Then you did what? I uh, got in the car. The guy that got in the car went over there. When I walked in, the guy was sitting on the floor against the wall, and his head was back. He was foaming at the mouth. His eyes were rolled back in his head. He was making these guttural, growling sounds. And uh, he'd start, you know, flopping his head back and forth. And we all started praying over him. So I started reading scripture, and he started foaming at the mouth more. We just kept praying, and all of a sudden, he, he'd get more violent in his uh, growling. All of a sudden, it's just like, bang, the lights went on in his eyes, and he had no idea what happened. Did you feel anything in the room? Oh, yeah, I definitely felt a dark presence, you know, just kind of skin-crawly kind of stuff. It, it was kind of a threatening presence, but, you know, I knew who was behind me. So you had no fear? No, no. When you received the call, did they say he was demon-possessed? Yeah, because of the way he was acting. Bob was a Christian, too, but he didn't really know what to do. He wasn't much of a Bible reader, which, you know. And you brought your Bible. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's the that's the key there. It's, it's the sword in the war. What type of scripture did you say over this man? Well, I was, like I say, uh, the we resist the devil and he'll flee from you. I tried to find as many things about casting out demons as I could, and I just read them. And I commanded him to get out in Jesus' name. How did this man act after this was over? Well, he didn't speak any English, but uh, his uh, girlfriend translated, and uh, he just said, what happened? Why am I on the floor? And uh, he had no idea anything happened. He didn't? No, he had no memory of it at all. He didn't feel any possession? I don't know uh, what led up to it or how it happened. I, I just I got the call after it was already going on. I don't know how long he had been that way. Did you ever tell many people about this experience? Uh, not really. I talked to other people that I know. A lot of churches just like to sweep that stuff under the rug. Don't you think churches fail to address this issue because of fear? I think it scares them. I think it's the kind of thing if we don't acknowledge it, it doesn't happen. It's kind of like ostriches. It was akin to an exorcism. I didn't really consider it an exorcism. I just did what Scripture told me to do. It's the Holy Spirit working in us. And, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit's in the spiritual realm fighting the demons. I thank Jeff for sharing his experience. My next guest literally has made exorcism his business. Archbishop Ron File has been the presiding director and chief exorcist of the Order of Exorcists since 1981. The Order of Exorcists, headquartered in Ontario, California, is under the independent Old Roman Catholic jurisdiction of the Sacred Order of St. Michael the Archangel. He has been in the Catholic ministry for over 37 years. Archbishop File, thanks for coming on the program. Thank you so much for the opportunity for sharing this with you and to the world, because uh, you know we, we, it's very important that we, we tell people that, uh, you know, that we exist, and if anyone has any problems with the demonic, they should contact us. Can you explain what is the Order of Exorcists? Yes, we have a Ministry of Exorcism, and it's international. Uh, we have members in 24 countries and 18 U.S. states. And what we do is we respond to people who request our services in the area of demonic investigation and demonic case assessment. Mm -hmm. And if we find that there's enough evidence that there is some form of demonic uh, involvement, then we contact the bishop of that particular jurisdiction, and then he assigns a priest to do the actual ritual of exorcism. Archbishop File. You are an exorcist. How many cases have you worked on? Uh, I'd say within about uh, the 36 years I've been in this ministry, I've done probably just over 2,000 actual cases. And that is actually saying the ritual and having a confirmed case of real demonic activity and nothing else other than mental illness or anything else that might be mimicking the symptoms of demonic possession. So to answer your question, yes, I have. Can you speak a little bit about your investigation team and what criteria is used to assess a case? We've been established since 1981. And uh, we've been servicing and we have uh, cases coming in on a daily basis. 
and I'm assigning these cases to our lead investigators and the clergy stand by uh, until these cases are confirmed as being genuine. Uh, if they are, then, of course, the clergy gets involved. Our um, lead exorcist investigators, as we call them, they are trained investigators, and they collect all the information, the evidence, physical or otherwise, and uh, also um, they obtain the medical and psychological examinations that we have. We have three physicians in my organization. Two of them are psychiatrists. Okay, you'll see members in different countries. Yes. Their um, their groups, their um, their affiliation with us, and the thing that we all have in common and that we share is this battle of good versus evil, and we do it by um, making ourselves available, training each of our people to do a proper demonic case assessment. And we have this down to in a, in a very analytical fashion where we take a scientific approach using the medical uh, community as a, a support system where we could rule out any forms of present psychosis. And even if there is a psychosis, it doesn't exclude them from being involved or being a victim of the demonic because the two can coexist. So there's a very fine line there. So we approach it in a very analytical fashion. We get, as I said, requests every day. If someone says to us, I feel I'm possessed by a demonic entity and I need an exorcism, we don't run out and do that. We have to make sure that we have the legal grounds to stand on for actually performing the ritual of exorcism. So we have to make sure that it's a, a valid case. So we investigate the individual, their immediate environment, we look for manifestations that can actually be recorded, taped, and, become, and it becomes part of our evidence base so I can make an assessment as to whether or not it's a genuine case. Has there been a surge in demonic activity over the past decade? My answer is going to be quite different than most. Most people will tell you, oh yes, it's, it, the cases are increasing, you know, we're hearing more and more people uh, are having symptoms of demonic possession or being um, somehow attacked by the demonic. My answer to your question mm -hmm. is no. I believe that the same amount of demonic activity that's taking place today has taken place 2,000 years ago, has taken place throughout time. The uh, increase of demonic activity being reported, yes, that's increasing because we have the Internet. We have the means of listening and watching things that take place around the world. Because we are in this technology, this modern technology, we could see the actual cases that are being reported. However, prior to that technology, the same amount of cases have always been in play. I don't think they've uh, increased. I don't think they've decreased. I think that Satan and his attack and his minions have been around, and they've been in full force from the beginning of time. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, uh, and I think I did, <laughs> uh, no, no, no. They, it's been go the only thing that's different is is that our technology has given us the ability to see cases that are being reported worldwide. But prior to that technology, the numbers were still the same. And what's happening now is, since we do have this technology, people are opening themselves up to other ideas. And as a result, that leaves them open for the demonic. Ideas that, uh, that, may, that they may read off a website or other information regarding the paranormal. And as a result, they are leaving themselves wide open, at least in, in a mental state. So, but, but getting back to the actual numbers, they're the same. Archbishop File, do you think pastors and local churches are taking the demonic aspect of the supernatural seriously? If not, where are the clergy? I wrote an article about this very thing. The name of the article is, Do Demons Really Exist? Where Are the Clergy? That's an excellent question. I've been looking for them for years. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, we have one of our exorcist bishops who is in Georgia. I had appointed him as a director of recruitment of clergy, and uh, so he's been pretty much uh, busy doing that. We have inquiries from around the world, and, of course, uh, since we have a, an open jurisdiction, we 
basically take anyone who has been appointed as an exorcist for their particular diocese or their bishop's jurisdiction within their ju- bishop's jurisdiction. That's a, um, another scenario that's, that's taking place even as I speak. I just spoke with Dr. Robert Bennett earlier, and he said, make your pastor listen. Now, how do you do that? Well, first of all, your everyday, quote, unquote, parish priest or pastor, if they haven't received an actual divine calling from God to do this type of ministry, then they would be out of their league in terms of what to do and how to do it. Anyone could read the ritual of exorcism, but having a divine calling is where the power comes from. It's not the words that are on the page. It's the divine power that comes from God. And when that person who is divinely appointed as an, as an appointed exorcist, he could perform the ritual. Our process, and in my organization, we have an analytical approach. Even before we get to that point, we have to confirm that it's not just a sheer matter of, of some form of psychosis, or perhaps maybe even a mental attention where they need to get the, uh, the attention of, of, of people or, or an organization. And there's so many different factors in the human, human condition. So what we do is we try to approach it by looking at the person, looking at their background, doing some research about where they live, their house, their environment, what they're claiming to be so. Uh, we try to get as much information as possible, and then we convert it into an assessment report, which I review. And based on the evidence, and that is also with, if it's a uh, demonic possession or possibly, I also would receive the psychology reports, the medical reports, to make sure that there are other things that we can rule out other than actually having a demonic involvement. So you see, we have to, like, we approach this in a very analytical process. And we just don't jump out and do and perform an exorcism because somebody says that they have a demon in them. Because there's too many other factors. If you perform an exorcism on a person who is just has a psychosis, you would feed into his psychic, and as a result, the condition, his condition could become worse instead of better. So we have to make sure that we are dealing what, well, with the genuine, the genuine article, per se. It, it cannot be something that may mimic the symptoms. We have to make sure the symptoms are truly of a demonic nature. And so we try to use our analytical approach to do just that. This has been very insightful, and I thank you for joining me, Archbishop File. God bless you and all the work that you do. And of note, Archbishop File will return and be the featured guest on an entire program. And one final thing, during my interview with Archbishop File, I asked him how Satan exploits communication devices to his advantage. And when I did this, this is what happened. Let me play the raw audio. You know, this is a question, and my response... Oh, you're breaking up. Uh, Try it again. Let me see if I hear you now. Are you there? If you want... You're breaking up. Could you call my line? Could you call me back? I'll hang up and we'll try that. Yeah. Okay, I will hang up. Coincidence or an example of what I was asking? Hey, Kristen, how about a closing prayer? This is from Johann Gerhard, Meditations on Divine Mercy. Johann Gerhard is one of the three great Lutheran theologians. After Luther and Martin Chemnitz, Gerhard is the third, after which there is no fourth. This is thanksgiving for Christ's suffering. Truly, most loving bridegroom, to you I am a blood bride. For my sake you poured forth blood so abundantly. Truly, fairest lily, to you I am an injurious and piercing thorn. I placed on you a harsh and enduring load. The weight of this so pressed you that drops of blood freely flowed from your body. Because of your love, Lord Jesus, only Redeemer and Mediator, I will sing psalms of praise to you for eternity. And that wraps it up for this program. I want to thank my wife, Kristen Collier, for prayer and scripture, and our announcer, Steve Matheson. He kicks us off and kicks us out. (laughs) Warren Cole Smith, Vice President of the Colson Center, will be with us next program. Until next time, remember, we can conquer all things in the name of Christ. This has been Confronting the Devil with your host, Kevin Collier. Visit online at confrontingthedevil.blogspot.com. Thank you.